everyone. Welcome to Pearson's Speaking About Pedagogy and Practice in English featured speaker series. Uh, I'm Allie Arnold. I'm uh, with the English marketing team here at Pearson, and I'm just thrilled that you could join us today. I hope that you'll find that the ideas being presented by our speaker, Joe Bizzup, uh, to be valuable to you and to your pedagogy and to you know, the actual practices in your classroom. Just a few minutes. Um, before we begin, I just want to sort of explain how the whole webinar or e-presentation format works. If you're calling in by phone, we have muted your line, and that's not um, because we don't want to hear from you, but it's simply to sort of reduce the ambient background noise that can occur so that Joe can present uh, without sort of the distractions and so that the recording that we're doing of the presentation uh, will be high quality for when we present it on our pedagogy and practice archives uh, for people to check out at a later time. Uh, there is a place where you can ask questions, and we do encourage you to ask questions by typing them in the box marked questions, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. It's in a, a webinar dashboard. If your dashboard seems to have sort of disappeared, you should see a little orange arrow, and if you click that, sort of a, a radio button, and it sort of would pull uh, the, the dashboard back down so that you can see it. You can send us questions at any point during the presentation, and when Joe has finished, what will happen is that I will sort of present your questions on your behalf to Joe, and we'll see how many he can get through in the time that remains. If there are questions that don't get answered, uh, don't worry. We're going to forward those to Joe, and he's going to respond to them. If you're a, a tweeter or you know uh, using some sort of social media, feel free to tweet toward uh, Pearson North Am, which was Pearson North America, or to use the hashtag Pearson Learn. Uh, we love to follow those people who are working, uh, you know, with us in this way and sort of collaborating. It makes it really sweet for us to be able to share favorite your tweets and um, yeah, see what you're saying. What else can I tell you? I'm going to tell you a little bit about Joe before I turn things over to him. He's an associate professor of English at Boston University, and there he directs the College of Arts and Sciences writing program. You probably know Joe, um, or at least know his work. His professional and research interests include writing program administration, writing pedagogy, writing in the professions, and of course, uh, approaches to argument and to style. Uh, he's the author of a good number of books, uh, including this um, textbook he's going to be talking about today, Style, Lessons and Clarity in Grades, the 11th edition, which he has edited. It was, um, of course, Joseph M. Williams' famous book. He's also taught and directed writing programs at Columbia and at Yale. So we're just thrilled that he could, uh, he's willing to share with us today his insights. Uh, the title of his lecture is Teaching with Style, Using Joseph Williams' Classic Guide with Students. And Joe, if you're ready, I'm ready to turn things over to you. Great, absolutely. So, what happened? There we are. We're seeing you now, Joe. Are we good? Oh, there it we go. looks good to me. All right, excellent. So thank you all for having me uh, here to talk with you today. I really appreciate your taking your time out of your day to attend the webinar. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thrill to be here uh, to talk, especially to talk about Joseph Williams's book. Uh, I encountered this book uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, too many years ago. I found an abandoned copy of the fourth edition in a study lounge. Uh, but I didn't become, uh, come to appreciate the book fully until I was out of school and teaching. And since then, the book has been incredibly influential on me, uh, shaping my approach to teaching perhaps more than any other influence. Uh, today, I want to talk about ways of using the ideas in this book uh, in teaching undergraduate writing, and especially in teaching uh, first-year writing. Uh, I want to start uh, by acknowledging, why am I not? I want to start by acknowledging uh, the remarkable accomplishment of this book. Uh, Williams' book is, was first published in 1981, and over its uh, 34 years, it has gone through 11 editions and sold uh, over half a million copies. Uh, that means, of course, with a secondary book market that 
probably a conservative estimate would be three quarters of a million people have, have put eyes on this book and used this book to improve their writing. So I just think that that's a remarkable, a remarkable achievement. Uh, Williams died, unfortunately, in 2008. Uh, the 10th edition was edited by his friend and colleague, Gregory Colomb. Uh, Greg uh, died in 2011, and so the book is now passed to me with the 12th edition, with the 11th edition, and now with the 12th. Uh, I'm just finishing editing the 12th edition now. Uh, I want to begin uh, by talking about uh, the foundational principles of Williams' pedagogy then move into uh, the principles of style that he discusses in the book, and then finally to turn to uh, teaching and how we might use these principles of teaching. Uh, I've been told that we have a mixed audience today and that I shouldn't expect everyone to be uh, familiar with Williams' approaches and ideas, so I'm going to begin uh, with an introduction to his ideas about style and then uh, toward the end of the, of the presentation move into talking about uh, his, his approach to uh, uh, what, what we can do with those ideas in teaching. So Williams' uh, approach to style grows out of his work in linguistics. Uh, he was a linguist uh, at, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and there in 1980, in collaboration with Wayne Booth, Frank Kinahan, Greg Colomb, he started the Little Red Schoolhouse, uh, which began as a series of lectures on writing and soon expanded into a program uh, on professional writing, offering courses for the MBA program and law school and so on. Uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse approach, uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse program is still at the University of Chicago, uh, but the approach has spread to many other institutions, uh, probably most notably today, the University of Virginia, where Greg uh, Colomb uh, with John DeRico uh, directed the academic and professional writing program. Uh, Williams also worked uh, extensively with government agencies and in private industry as a consultant and writing coach. And his experience with helping professionals write clearly is formative uh, to the book. Uh, so that's, that's going to be very important. Uh, foundational positions uh, that, uh, that ground the book uh, are, are, are displayed here. Uh, this is a quotation from uh, one of the editions of Style, and I think it sums up uh, exactly uh, the perspective that Williams brings to teaching style. This is a book about writing based on our ways of reading. Uh, Williams uh, realized that clarity is not a property of texts, but an impression or feeling of readers. Uh, consequently, uh, and that these impressions vary with expertise. Uh, this is something that Steven Pinker in his book has recently called the curse of knowledge, but it's an idea that is very much uh, foundational to Williams because it sets up the paradox that Williams' book uh, addresses, which is that writers are responsible for making choices in their writing, but they cannot trust their own judgments about the clarity or readability of their writing. They need readers uh, to tell them if their writing is clear, and as important, or more importantly, they need principles that they can follow to assess and revise their writing. So relying on one's own impressions, this seems clear to me, is not an effective way of judging the clarity of one's own work. Uh, happily, readers respond to sentences, passages, and whole sections of texts in predictable ways. Uh, and we can capitalize on those expectations and, and, and responses uh, to write in ways that our readers will find clear, coherent, understandable, and memorable. Uh, what Williams' book does is it distills his research on these predictable responses into a small set of uh, broadly applicable principles uh, that writers can apply and use to write clearly in, in their writing. Uh, these principles are uh, not uh, rules. They're not uh, must-dos. Rather, they are guidelines that are meant to structure a writer's choices about how a writer wants to communicate. Uh, finally, for Williams, style is not about correctness, uh, but, it is not, it, but it is rather about choice, about the choices that writers can make to communicate with their readers. And then finally, style is ultimately an ethical issue. Uh, Williams' first, uh, Williams's first rule of ethical writing is write unto others as you would have others write unto you. So let's move into uh, his... His, his principles, the principles he outlines in his, in his book. Uh, this is my distillation. Uh, the book does not articulate the principles in precisely this form, but I think it's a fair summary of, of a book that runs uh, uh, 250 pages or so. So the first principle is 
sentences tell stories, uh, and we want we want sentences tell stories, and we want uh, the subjects of our sentences to be the characters in the stories that we are telling. Uh, second principle, express actions as verbs. We want the actions uh, that are being performed by the characters in those stories to be uh, the verbs in our sentences, uh, not moved into other parts of the sentence, and especially not uh, reified as nouns. Uh, we want old information uh, uh, to frame our understanding of a sentence to come before new information. Uh, we want short units of information before long units of information. And then finally, we want uh, uh, information at the beginning of a sentence that tells us what the sentence is about, uh, that is then followed by information that tells us what the sentence is emphasizing or stressing. Uh, we can also represent these principles uh, graphically. Uh, this is, is Williams' graph and my uh, uh, commentary on the sides. So what I, what I understand Williams to be arguing or, 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 or asserting in his book is that we can think of sentences as a kind of laminate, uh, as operating at three different levels. We have a grammatical level in which we want to align the grammatical subject and the grammatical verb with the character of the story and the action of the story that we're telling. Uh, we also have an informational level. And if we organize our sentences so that short information uh, precedes long information, uh, we will uh, allow our readers to understand our sentences more effectively. And then finally, we have what I call rhetorical level, which is, is uh, uh, what are you trying to get your readers to focus on? How are you directing your readers' attention? What do you want, how do you want to shape their interpretations? And here we have topical information, framing information, coming before information that you want to stress or emphasize. Right? So that's, that's how the system uh, works, works together. One of the great things about Williams' approach is that it is a an integrated approach that, that uh, all of the principles are mutually reinforcing and the principles obtain not only at the sentence level but also at the level of short passages where they uh, govern coherence and cohesion and even at the level of larger sections and, and whole documents where they govern the way a reader might navigate and, and absorb uh, a longer and more complex argument. So let me by way of introduction uh, step through each of the five principles and give you some brief illustrations of, of the argument uh, that Williams makes about style and the, the, the way he presents style in the book. So here are some passages uh, that we can look at. Uh, this is a typical Williams format uh, presenting multiple variations of a, the same passage. I'd just like you to take a moment and read through these different sentences. So when we, when we read them, uh, the A version uh, in Williams' examples is usually the version that is, is deemed less clear. The B version is the version that is more clear. And sometimes he would present a C version in which there was a, an alternative version, uh, uh, an, another acceptable or, or, or uh, similarly clear uh, sentence. So what we notice in the first, what I'd like to point out is if, if, we, if, we, look at the, if we look at this first sentence, uh, and we can, we can identify, pick out the subject of the sentence and explanation of the war's causes, uh, we notice that there's no character here. Uh, the character in the sentence, the concrete entity that is doing action, is Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. So ideally, we would like the character, Lincoln, to be the subject, and we would like the action, uh, we would like the char character, Lincoln, to be the subject, and we would like the action uh, uh, explaining to be the verb. So, an explanation of the war's causes is contained in Lincoln's third paragraph becomes, in his third paragraph, Lincoln explains what caused the war. Uh, this is a much more understandable story. It's a much clearer story. It's a much more recognizable, uh, much more ap uh, apprehensible story than, uh, than the version, the, the, the nominalized version that begins with uh, an explanation rather than with Lincoln as the subject. Uh, the important thing, though, is not simply to pick the most concrete character here, Abraham Lincoln. We also want to pick uh, a character that tells an appropriate story. Uh, this sentence is about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, most readers of the sentence, or, 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 or I would guess most people talking about the Gettysburg Address would, would want to talk about Lincoln and his ideas. But if one were, say, an English professor or a rhetorician, one might want to talk about the text itself. So we could have a sentence like this 
uh, where the subject is not Lincoln, but the subject becomes uh, Lincoln's paragraph. So Lincoln's third paragraph explains the causes of the war. This is still a more clear version uh, than the first, ver the first sentence, because paragraph is a more concrete and visualizable entity than this, this, uh, this entity here of an explanation of the war's causes. Uh, we see this pattern uh, throughout various forms of professional writing uh, and also in academic writing. Here's a passage from, uh, written by a political scientist, uh, and you can see the highly nominalized abstract uh, version in, in 2A, and then a revision of it that at attaches the idea to a concrete character in uh, version 2B. Uh, in the 1990s, the partition of existing states and even, in severe cases, the segregation of population through forcible transfer became attractive as a possible means of resolving ethno-religious tensions. Uh, the subject of the sentence, we notice, uh, is very, very many were, is very, very long, uh, a long noun phrase, which makes it uh, difficult, to under, difficult to understand and grasp and visualize and tell a story about it. Therefore, it's clearer if we append the idea to a concrete character like policy analysts. In the 1990s, some policy analysts were attracted to the idea and then we, in the end of the sentence, give the long abstraction uh, to the idea that tensions between ethnic and religious groups might be resolved by partitioning existing states or even, in severe cases, by forcibly segregating populations. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is William's first two principles. Uh, take a character as your subject, uh, keep your subject short, and uh, take an action as your verb, and then get quickly past the subject and the verb and into uh, the complement that follows. Uh, this is just a, a gloss of, of uh, the sentences, and what you'll see if you go through this, I'll make the PowerPoint available uh, through Pearson. Uh, in the B and C versions, we have an alignment between characters and subjects and actions and verbs. In the A versions, we often have actions turned into nouns and moved into the subject position, while characters get displaced into really peripheral positions like uh, possessive nouns and so on. As we depart from these principles, you can actually see that the clarity of a sentence begin to degrade. Uh, so in this version, uh, this is a two-character example. You can see the, sen you can see the sentences. Uh, the first version is a prototypically clear sentence. Uh, retailers have increasingly consolidated and centralized functions. Uh, we can change those verbs into nouns, as we do here. Uh, the sentence is still pretty clear because it's anchored in a strong character. But we can also, once we change our verbs into nouns, we can move our nouns into the subject position of the sentences, and then the sentence starts to become uh, more opaque. Instead of talking about retailers and customers, we're now talking about retailer consolidation and centralization and customer objections. Uh, finally, uh, we can uh, uh, cut characters altogether. Uh, once we move characters out of the subject position and make them modifiers to, to nouns, uh, we're then tempted to cut them and eliminate them entirely, cutting information from the sentence. Uh, these, sen these kinds of very abstract sentences can actually seem clearer than uh, the more complicated sentence, uh, sentences like this one, but in fact, uh, you lose information and they can be very difficult for readers to understand and grasp. Uh, this pattern uh, becomes even more pronounced uh, there's a, so when you add, when you have three characters instead of just two. So in this version, we have a three-character story. Uh, if you read the first one, you can pick it up. Uh, once upon a time, there were investors uh, who preferred regulators to require companies to document all of their financial instruments at fair value. So we have a story. There are investors, regulators, and companies. Uh, investors wanting to invest, uh, companies uh, waiting to be bought and sold, and regulators setting the rules of the game. Uh, but if we move these concrete characters out of the sub subject positions of our sentences and clauses, we end up with something as abstract as number three. Uh, investors' general preference is for a regulatory requirement for documentation of all of the company's financial instruments at fair value, rather than for allowing application of fair value by companies on an instrument-by-instrument -instrument basis. Uh, so this is the kind of highly nominalized, abstract, uh, professional prose that Williams tried to combat. And his entire argument is uh, about characters and actions is pick concrete characters to ground your reader's understanding in the story that you're telling, and that will make your prose more clear. 
So here is uh, uh, the, the explanation. First one, characters are actions, subjects, actions are verbs. Here, we still have characters as subjects, but actions have become nouns. Uh, here, we have displaced the characters from the subjects. And then finally, in four, we are deleting the characters entirely all, and, and altogether. Uh, the third principle of, of Williams' uh, uh, style is to prefer old, put old information before new information. And so here is just a very simple example of that principle at work. Uh, in general, uh, we tend to tell students to prefer the active voice to the passive. So we would prefer sentence 1A to, two, to 1B. But our preference is really dictated not by the voice of the verb, but by the order of information. And so if uh, we've got two packets of information in the sentence, we've got the collapse of a dead star into a point no larger than a marble, and we've also got the idea of a black hole. So depending on which, uh, com which, informa which information is new uh, and which information is old, uh, we would structure the sentence a different way. Okay. So uh, in context, we probably prefer the passive version. So take a look at 1A and 1B. Some astonishing questions about the nature of the universe have been raised by scientists studying black holes in space. And then here's 1A. The collapse of a star into a point no larger than a marble creates a black hole. So much compression, uh, so much matter compressed in just a little volume changes the fabric of space around it in puzzling ways. Uh, that version, it might seem a little bit choppy to you. This version, on the other hand, uh, will seem better because you're, you're linking the idea of a black hole in space uh, uh, that we pick up at the end of this sentence to the beginning of the next, and then we're linking the idea of matter being compressed into uh, the subject of the third sentence. Some astonishing questions about the nature of the universe have been raised by scientists studying black holes in space. A black hole is created by the collapse of a star into a point perhaps no larger than a marble. Such matter compressed into a little volume changes the fabric of space around it in uh, changes the fabric of space around it in puzzling ways. Here you see graphically uh, how the principles work. So I've underlined one kind of information uh, about black holes in orange and the collapse of the star into a point no larger than the marble in green. And you see that here we go orange, green, orange, green, back and forth. Here, uh, where we begin the sentence with the old information from the previous sentence and end with the new, we have a nice flow. Uh, we pick up this piece of information and begin the next sentence. And then in this sentence, we pick up the piece of information and begin the next. And so the principle of old to new uh, helps us understand the sentences, but also uh, governs, our, uh, governs our sense of flow and rhythm in the sentence. Williams' fourth principle is to, is to give short information uh, before long information. So take a look at these sentences. The first, 1A, you might find a little bit uh, tedious to get through, and that is because you've got this long, uh, uh, the verb is here, so you've got this long subject phrase that, that occupies two and a half lines, and then this, and we have this little, we have a verb, and then we have a very short uh, uh, predicate at the end. Uh, if we reverse that, uh, we get a much clearer sentence. Her fine barbecue sauce was characterized by a delicate balance among its many ingredients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can also feel, uh, even when, when we don't have trouble understanding a sentence, if we violate this principle of moving from short to long, we can end up with a, um, a sentence that feels awkward. So look at 2A. Uh, the school emphasizes sustained collaboration among its talented students and faculty and rigorous instruction. Uh, that uh, ending and rigorous instruction can feel flat because, it's, uh, because of the shortness of that final phrase. Uh, compare to B. The school emphasizes rigorous instruction and sustained collaboration. Um, the, the school emphasizes rigorous instruction and sustained collaboration among its talented students and faculty. The rhythm of that is, is, is much clearer, much more graceful. Uh, finally, we have Williams' fifth principle, which is which is that we should, we should begin with topical information, information that tells us what a sentence is about, and we should end with information that we want to stress. Uh, sometimes we have a generic category, my favorite novel, that we then populate is Jane Eyre. Uh, so this is the topic of the sentence, my favorite novel, and this is what's stressed, the particular novel that I'm talking about. 
Uh, sometimes, as in 3A and 3B, we want to uh, put stressed concepts at the end of our sentence to punch up our, our, our meaning. Uh, this is a passage from uh, the education critic Mark Edmondson uh, lamenting the commercialization of the university. And what I want you to notice, I'm not going to read it out loud, but I want you to just notice that he ends each of his sentences with a, uh, he ends each of his sentences with uh, a language about business, about buyers, and about brands uh, that really emphasizes his point that universities have become increasingly uh, uh, commercialized and enslaved to the business model. If we take those ideas out of the end of the sentence and put them at the in the middle of the sentence and bury them, we see that Edmondson's critique actually becomes muted and blunted. So uh, the force of Edmondson's passage depends on how he locates the stress uh, and what concepts specifically he wants to stress at the end of his sentences. Sometimes uh, we, the, the, the stress of a sentence can even alter its meaning. Uh, we expect information that comes early in the sentence to, to be framing information, topicalizing information, and we expect information that comes at the end to be information that's being emphasized or stressed that we're supposed to think about. So my question would be, which of these two companies would you like to invest your money in? Uh, the company's sales are strong, but its stock has dipped. Uh, but its stock has dipped recently, uh, or the company's stock has dipped recently, but its sales are strong. Uh, I think the first makes the company sound like it's in trouble. The second, uh, because it puts the emphasis on the strong sales, makes the company sound like a bargain. So you see here, I've just underlined the uh, the topicalizing information in blue and the stressed information in in orange, and you can see the analysis here in the sentences. Okay, so those, that is, uh, that is the, a quick thumbnail tour of Williams's ideas about style. I want to talk now about uh, how we might bring those ideas into our classroom. Uh, Williams gives us great stuff. His approach has many significant benefits. Uh, it takes students seriously as writers. Uh, it, 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 it does not look at students as, as incompetent. It does not look at students as struggling. It looks at students as people, as human beings, uh, with, with uh, serious ideas who, want, who need to communicate them to readers. Uh, it emphasizes and an educates choice. I think this is very important in a pedagogical context. Uh, the book is not about what you must do. It is about what you can do uh, and how to make informed choices among the options that you have. Uh, it builds on uh, students' intuitions as readers to teach clear writing. Uh, so we're not st imagining students as tabula rasa that we have to start uh, and starting at, at ground zero. We're actually building on intuitions that they already have, which is which is incredibly powerful. Uh, it integrates a small number of principles into a coherent system with broad application. Uh, in this way, it's very different from typical usage manuals, uh, which offer a, a vast array of principles with very narrow application. Uh, it also is practical. It emphasizes that we uh, need to write not only clearly, uh, but also efficiently. And that's something that uh, is, is certainly not lost. That's a benefit and a position that's certainly not lost on students. And then finally, it makes uh, style a matter of uh, it makes style matter in a civic and ethical sense. Uh, so it's not just about uh, writing for your English professor, it's about actually writing in a way that allows you to participate as a citizen in society, and students appreciate that as well. Uh, nevertheless, the book also does pose some challenges to teaching. Uh, the first is, uh, arises from Williams' investment in professional writing. Uh, the villain in style is the highly uh, abstract, nominalized, complex, technical prose that is the coin of the realm or is, that is written widely in professions, academic professions, law, business, medicine, uh, you name it. Uh, one of the challenges of using the book with undergraduates then is that most undergraduates don't yet write badly in the ways that style aims to correct. Uh, we, uh, we've all seen undergraduate writing. Uh, it usually does not look like those A version sentences that I showed you in, in that earlier slide. It usually has other issues, uh, uh, developing and supporting its ideas, uh, syntactical control, issues of diction, issues of organization, tone, point of view, and so on. And so we, we have to adjust Williams' book to address the issues that are of concern 
to our undergraduate students, not just to uh, 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 professional writers. Uh, ideally, though, we can use the book, uh, we can get, get them the ideas early uh, and save them from becoming uh, 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 bad professional writers later, later down the line. Uh, the book has little to say about invention. Uh, again, coming from Williams's perspective as a uh, focus on professional writing, his tendency is to hold meaning constant and adjust sentences uh, to convey that meaning more clearly. Uh, that is not, however, uh, what we often do in first-year writing classes. In first-year writing classes, we need to emphasize dra that drafting and revision are matters not just of editing and communicating our meaning, but of actually uh, 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 thinking and figuring out our meaning. And so that's an important uh, translation that we have to make. Uh, the book offers uh, a limited treatment of genre. Uh, this is not a criticism, but an observation. Uh, Williams was writing the book in the early 80s, which is right at the beginning of what I would call the genre revolution in writing studies. Uh, and so we cannot expect his book to uh, have a, the same sophisticated approach to genre that we might find uh, and expect in first-year composition classes in 2015. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we can make adjustments to accommodate that and to extend Williams' ideas from the genres of professional writing to other genres that students might be, be involved in. And finally, the book is pitched at a fairly high level uh, for first-year writing students, and its exercises are often artificial revision exercises rather than uh, exercises that use students in writing. So what to do about this? Uh, what we need to do is get style uh, out of the book and into the classroom. Uh, we need to design assignments. Uh, that involve students' own writing, uh, that address thinking, planning, and invention, that entail giving and receiving feedback. And then finally, we need to, to uh, emphasize agency and choice. Uh, so what I want to do now is share with you some assignments that uh, have been successful for me and that have also been successful for uh, a number of my colleagues in, in the writing programs in which I've worked uh, who use the book in, in their classes and with their students. So the first assignment that I would like to talk about is a make it better, make it worse exercise. Uh, the idea here is just to get students to play around with language. Uh, take a sentence from each student's paper, uh, put it into a PowerPoint, make sure every student's represented, represented in, the, in the list. Have students work in pairs. Each pair picks one sentence, uh, two sentences. Uh, one, that, one that they like, that they think is clear, and one that they think could be made better. Uh, their task is to improve the sentence that could be made better and to make the good sentence less clear by manipulating it. So we manipulate it in both directions. And this, this, this uh, exercise presented as a game can be a lot of fun for students. Uh, we can also have students uh, think about characters, topics, and point of view. Uh, they can go through and highlight those beginning elements of their sentences in a draft. Uh, what are your subjects? What are your characters? What are your topics? And then ask themselves questions about them. Do they make up a coherent set? Uh, do they, uh, uh, could we change? Could we rewrite the paragraph to make it more coherent? Or if it's coherent, could we rewrite it uh, to emphasize a different point of view? We have uh, activities that emphasize reading, uh, especially in diverse genres. Uh, one activity is a readability analysis. Go through, give students uh, some texts in some different genres, a newspaper, editorial, an academic journal, et cetera. Have students rate how readable they find these texts, then use Williams' principles to explain the ratings that they've just given, including variations. Uh, another exercise is to use Williams' principles to, show, to analyze competing arguments, to show how arguments happen not only at the level of, uh, not only at the level of, 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 of content, but at the level of style, uh, and to do scavenger hunts. So a great exercise is to have students go out into the world and in their everyday reading, find examples uh, of prose uh, that exemplify or violate specific principles of style, including ethical ones. And students really enjoy uh, this kind of, kind of exercise. Uh, we can design assignments that address thinking, planning, and invention. A great one that I, that I inherited from Greg Colomb is the cast of characters assignment, which is, is to uh, before drafting, have students just write down two or three characters that they are going to use as the subjects or topics of most of their sentences. 
And this is a priming exercise that helps students focus their point of view and think about the arguments that they want, want to make. Uh, it might be possible to talk about a poem, for example, in terms of uh, the poet. Uh, we could talk about it in terms of stanzas and lines, or we could talk about it in terms of thematic concepts. Uh, each of those papers would be about the same poem and maybe contain the same ideas, but the ideas would be expressed in a different, uh, from a different perspective and a different point of view. Uh, finally, we can help student, give students uh, sentence templates that encourage them to, to challenge and extend their thinking. And we can do a copia exercise where we ask students to take a sentence and see how many different ways they can, they can, can say it or, or, or express the thought in the sentence. So all of these are ways to bring the ideas, uh, bring our ideas actively into the classroom and to, to make style and William's book a, a, a live part of our composition and writing classes. Uh, we also want to think about designing uh, assignments in ways that encourage students uh, to use the concepts in the book to give and receive feedback. Uh, one that I, I, I especially like is uh, impressions. Uh, we know that readers, writers cannot rely on their own impressions of clarity uh, to, to edit their work, but what they can do is use Williams' principles to understand and explain to themselves the impressions of their readers. So I like to enact that process in uh, the peer review sessions that I conduct with my own students. Uh, ask a reader to identify with a single word an impression of a, that created by a paragraph or a section. And then another student, who may or may not be the writer, uses Williams' principles to analyze the prose in order to explain the impression that the first reader communicated. Uh, so that uh, is a, a quick tour of Williams' book and a quick uh, uh, list of some exercises that uh, have been successful uh, for teachers in the programs that I've directed uh, using his ideas. And with that, I'll stop and, and welcome uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was just delightful. I think I took three pages of notes, and um, I feel like I learned a tremendous amount. Um, for those of you who are on the call, please use the um, what did we call it, the dashboard, the webinar control panel, to type in some questions there. And, um, and as we're waiting for those to come in, Joe, I have, I have a couple of questions lined up for you. Um, the first is, I know, I, I taught, before I jumped out of the ivory tower and started working for Pearson, I, I taught for 14, 15 years. And I frequently taught these very similar lessons in style, and the, the one issue that I confided often was that students, especially students coming from backgrounds in which they, you know, weren't as, as literate as maybe we might hope when they're entering college, um, maybe their parents weren't readers, maybe they weren't encouraged to be readers, are under the misimpression that this kind of opaque language is what they're striving for. Uh, and I wonder if do you face that kind of um, misimpression among among your student body, and if so, how do you combat that? Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, David Bartholomew, of course, talks about interlanguages and students trying to approximate students coming in from high school to college trying to approximate the language of the academy uh, and getting it wrong. So there's a kind of double uh, double distortion that happens. Uh, First, they, the students don't understand and have, a, have an accurate notion of what the language of the academy is. And second, they approximate their flawed notion badly. Right? They don't have the skills to actually enact or write uh, in the idealized way that they, that they imagine academic language to be written. I think the same thing happens when we move uh, into, into our professions. We have a distorted view and perhaps a narrow view of what uh, the range of options allowed in our professional discourses, and and we we approximate those ideals uh, uh, not ideally. Uh, there are also uh, significant pressures, uh, social pressures, uh, on young professionals especially that should not be underestimated. Uh, specifically, the pressure is for a, a young professional to write in the most abstract, most technical, most jargon-filled version of the professional discourse in which the student is participating. And the reason for that is very simple. It's hard to find that middle ground, uh, language that is professional, yet still clear, 
that sounds sophisticated yet is approachable and so on. It's, 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 it's very easy to err in one direction or the other. Uh, most young people, or not young people, but most uh, entry-level professionals uh, will uh, feel pressed to err on the side of asserting their professionalism by, by, by being conservative and being overly technical and overly complicated. It would be much better to be criticized by your boss for being uh, too technical and too complicated and too specialized uh, rather than to be criticized for not sounding professional at all. So I think this is, a, this is an enormous pressure, and it, it's one that, that was a crucial concern and an abiding concern to Joe Williams throughout his career. And I think it's a pressure that's still with us today, and it's one of the reasons why the book has, has uh, thrived for its 30, 34 years. Uh, I regularly get emails from readers who notice that I have inherited the book and write testimonials to me uh, telling me how, how important the book was to them uh, when they were just beginning their careers, or when they entered graduate school, or when they, they had to start writing for clients. So those are very touching stories, and I think, I think they speak to uh, the power of Williams' book to address exactly the, the concern that you, you raised in your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I have another question, but I'm going to put it on the back burner and get now to the questions that are posed by our ten, those who are in attendance. We've had quite a few roll in, actually, and unfortunately, we, we do only have eight minutes remaining. So just want to repeat what the, the early announcement, but if we were not able to get to all of your questions, that uh, Joe was um, graciously agreed to uh, respond to them sort of off, online, offline, if you will, later, I think is the simplest way to say that. <laughs> um, Jackie Justice, who has the best name, I think, of all the attendees today, <laughs> says, any plans to create a support website for the tax with activities and tools? I think it's a world enough and time question. Uh, I think that would be a great idea. It's something that I'm certainly open to talking with Pearson about, and it's something that is is uh, uh, lacking. So, so I think that's a that's a terrific idea. Um, yes, I would I would love to to talk with with uh, with Pearson about about the possibility of doing something like that. It's a it's a great suggestion. We'll have to talk about that. Joe. it is a really good idea. Um, a lot of uh, Farrell, or, uh, and, and I, I apologize if I molested your name there, uh, asks, how do we practice those principles through online courses? Boy, that's a million dollar question. What do you think, Joe? Well, I think the, the, the great thing about the principles for online courses is that uh, they are explicitly teachable. So, so uh, it does not rely, the, the, the pedagogy that Williams adopted was not a romantic pedagogy in the sense that uh, students did work and then uh, arrived at the end of that work with, at an epiphanic revelation of something about some aspect of writing. Uh, the principles are, are articulable, they're stated in the book, uh, and students can go out and, and use them to see how writing works in the world. So I think that explicitness, that concreteness, is something that makes the book ideally suited and the approach ideally suited for an, an online an online pedagogy. Thank you. Uh, Tony Wallace wants to know uh, how soon in the assignment sequence how soon in the assignment sequence do you begin to sort of introduce these these principles of style? So. I tend to introduce them uh, uh, informally all the way along uh, as I'm working with students in conferences and in, 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 uh, in individual meetings and in, in small groups. I, I, in my first year writing classes, especially in the fall semester, I tend to start at a kind of mid-level of concern, so I will, I will focus uh, more on uh, argumentation and arrangement and, and uh, organization of the paper as a whole rather than individual sentences or nuances of style. Uh, the reason for that is I want the students to be able to uh, understand the genre of the academic essay as uh, and to get that first, and then we can use that as a context to do intensive work on style. Uh, we have a two-semester sequence in, at BU, uh, it, the program in which I direct, and when I teach the second course, I use these principles uh, pretty explicitly all the way through. I really look at that second course as an opportunity to dive in and work with students on 
uh, stylistic issues. Considering our time, Joe, I'm going to kind of combine a few of the remaining questions. We're not going to get through all of them, unfortunately. But um, Marissa and Mike and uh, I believe it's maybe Annette have asked some questions that sort of relate to one another. And they have to do with, you know, how well students need to understand the you know, basic grammar and like the names of the nomenclature of grammar. Uh, and, and specifically um, thinking in terms of, of um, you know, um, American English speakers, but also the speakers of, you know, who, who are coming to English uh, as a second or maybe third language. Um, yeah, the, the do, you, is, do you spend time? Go ahead. Yeah, the book, the book is great for that. Uh, the great thing about the book is that it is a few principles that have broad application. So if you read the book, you'll see that it is, it is, it is highly grammatical. Right, it deals with, with, there's a lot of grammar in the book, uh, relative clauses, resumptive modifiers, different uh, attention to different kinds of voice, uh, uh, different kinds of phrasal structures, but you don't need to know all of that grammar to get the benefit of the book. You need to know three things. You need to know how to identify the subject of a sentence, the whole subject of a sentence. You need to be able to pick out the simple subject, which is the noun, the single noun that might be in the noun phrase that is the subject. And you need to be able to identify a verb. And if you can do those three things, find the whole subject, find the simple subject, and find the verb of a sentence, you can understand and apply Williams' principles. So uh, that simplicity, uh, that's really the, the, the genius of the book. It takes a few simple concepts, and, and, but applies them in incredibly powerful ways. So, so uh, 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 the answer to the question is you don't need an elaborate grammatical apparatus to understand and use the book. You need a few simple ideas. Uh, that being said, uh, the more grammar you know, I think Williams would say, the better, that he's, he's a linguist. And, and he, is, he is not someone who is averse to students acquiring explicitly grammatical knowledge. What he is averse to is uh, when we mistake uh, the good of correctness, uh, when we take correctness to be the greatest good. Correctness is a good for Williams, but it is not the greatest good. The greatest good is writerly choice and how our, our understanding of the language and our understanding of the grammar can inform the choices we make as writers and as communicators. That's just a wonderful note to, to close on, Joe. There are so many good questions left, and I'm sorry that we didn't get the one, especially the one about grading. But just so you know, Joe is going to reach out to you guys and. And Joe, if you wanted to CC me on those, then I might, if with, it, with everyone's um, agreement, of course, post them on the English Instructor Exchange um, sort of discussion board that we keep on our sure. uh, link yeah. from our pedagogy. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, as we're closing here, just again, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for joining us this afternoon. And if you ever want to reach out to me, um, my name is Allie Arnold, and my email address is allison.arnoldatpearson.com. We archive uh, this and all of our previous lectures on our Pedagogy and Practice website at pedagogyandpractice.pearsonhighered.com. Um, you can do just a quick search for someone's last name or a topic that you're interested in and find a wealth of video presentations there. Uh, they all are, as this one, 50 minutes uh, or shorter, so that they're great for showing at your professional development. Um, um, what's the word professional development workshops that you're having on campus perhaps, and we'd love it if you do that. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week for Sarah DeBacher's uh, talk. She is the WPA at the University of Vermont, and so we're going to be getting a good Southern view. And Joe, thank you. Just really appreciate it. That was wonderful. Great. Thank you. And, and let, me thank, let me also thank all the attendees for the time they spent with us this afternoon. I, I very much appreciate uh, their attention and thoughtfulness. Before you leave us, will you give them your email address in case anybody wants to reach out to you? Yes. My email address is on the screen, uh, displayed on the screen. It is jbizup at bu.edu. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I hope that you have a, a wonderful rest of your afternoon and a great end of your week tomorrow. Goodbye.